Greetings to you and welcome to the teaching ministry of the way of life, Tabernacle. And uh, this day of the week, we take time to look at how we can carry out evangelism. That, uh, as I've mentioned before, our passion, our passion here in this ministry is to make sure that as many people hear the good news of the saving work of Jesus Christ and his coming kingdom. And uh, we don't just talk, we do the work and we go out in the field. And today we're going to look at practical evangelism. Practical evangelism. Some of you are doing this and some of you are hesitating to do this. But I pray that after this lesson, you will learn something that will encourage you to continue to do it or to actually start to do it. And what we're going to do in this session, it may be two or three sessions on the, the, the same type uh, topic, is we're going to follow the master himself. We're going to follow Jesus himself into the field of evangelism. We're going to learn from him what he did and how he did it. We're going to read John chapter 4 verses 1 to 42. And I will pay attention to read through and I also want you to pay attention to see the interaction of Jesus and this woman and to see how Jesus truly focused on his mission irrespective of the fact that he might have been on enemy territory or also that you know there were so many barriers between him and the woman and also the fact that the woman kept dodging the message and and and, and turning to religion and to tradition and things like that this is a typical situation which some of you have encountered or you are going to encounter so come along let's see what did jesus do john chapter 4 the pharisees heard that jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than john although in fact it was not jesus who baptized but his disciples when the lord learned of this he left judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well it was about the sixth hour, like midday. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me to drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Then the woman, the Samaritan woman said to him, um, You are a Jew. And I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then the explanation here is that for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water so the woman said you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep where can you get this living water are you greater than our father jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and herds jesus answered Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him 
will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, <laughs> and the man you are now, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Huh. So, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans, Worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah, who is called the Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you, I am he. Verse 27, the disciples had come back. Jesus, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, Who, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town. That's the disciples. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more? And then the harvest, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap where you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their level. Verse 39. Reaction of the Samaritans. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Yes, many believed because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. 
Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man is really the savior of the world. So we see here a beautiful scenario between Jesus and this woman whom you can describe as the chief of sinners. She's been married five times, married this one, living, married this one, living, and now he's living with another man. And then she has a conversation with Jesus. And with all the barriers that existed there, she is a Samaritan, she is a woman. Jesus still stayed focused on her soul to give her eternal life. So from this passage, I've come up with some principles, 12 in number, that we will examine. We're not going to rush through this. We may do it in three sessions, I'm supposing, or two. And then we'll look at the principles from Jesus' method here that can help us to do evangelism. Principle number one, Samaria might have been considered enemy territory. Samaria might have been considered enemy territory. You are going to go to witness in places that people will be hostile to you. Places that people may suppose that you shouldn't go there. So when Jesus sent out the 12 disciples, he instructed them not to go to the towns of the Samaritans. When he sent them out, he said, no, don't go to the towns of the Samaritans. Just go to the lost tribes of Israel. But now, it, it, Jesus is passing through Samaria and he is there witnessing to someone. So I say here that going through Samaria might have been the shortest route for him to just go to where they were going. Because we are told here that he left Judea and had to go back to Galilee and had to go through Samaria. And the father had orchestrated this to happen. So that was principle number one. He had to go through Samaria. You may be going out to do witnessing in a situation that is hostile in enemy territory. Keep your cool and do the work of an evangelist. Principle number two. Being tired and exhausted should not be an excuse for you not to witness. Being tired and exhausted should not be an excuse for you to do the gospel or to witness to people. In this case, we see that Jesus was indeed tired. He was hungry and he was sitting by the well, not even having a means to drink the water. So say, and Jesus, tired as he was, from the journey sat down by the well yes jesus was tired because he had walked but an opportunity came for him to witness to evangelize and he did not let that opportunity to go so in your life no matter how tired you are you should always be praying that the father should give you an opportunity to witness to someone whether it's in, you're walking or whether it's in the car or whenever, be ready for the opportunity. So I say here that physical exhaustion and tires, tiredness should not stop us from doing evangelism. We must always be ready to seize every opportunity as the Holy Spirit prompts us. We say principle number one, you may. Be witnessing in enemy territory principle number two tiredness and exhaustion should not be an excuse for you not to witness as we see here with the case of jesus who was tired and sitting by the well but still spent time to witness principle number three never let go an opportunity without witnessing even if you were not out for witnessing Principle number three, never let go an opportunity to witness even if you were not out to do witnessing. Some people, 
when the opportunity is travel with their tracks you know i have a backpack that i travel with here always with my tracks in them i know that culturally in america it is a different thing where it's assumed that everybody knows the gospel but they don't know and <laughs> it is really a hostile environment because people have not just believed but they have a resistance and a hatred towards the gospel but we are always looking for opportunities to witness when the Holy Spirit prompts you don't fail to witness some people like I say will always carry a track with them or maybe you wear your evangelism shirt or something that would draw attention to you and somebody will be like uh, what do you mean by that and say oh I love Jesus he died for me he saved me would you like to be saved so don't let go any opportunity always be prepared so we read here in verse 7 of John 4 when a Samaritan woman came to draw water Jesus said to her will you give me to drink this was an opportunity that presented itself and Jesus did not let it go. He did not let it go. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, we are told that set apart Christ as Lord in your heart and always be ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that you have in you. There are some things that we're going to touch that we will see why and how you can always have the Lord in your lips ready to talk about him. Some people are Christians in name only. Some people are believers in name only. And they feel embarrassed if they're asked about Jesus or about the faith. You should not be. You should always be ready. And how can you be ready? We're going to look at that later. Principle number four. You can introduce eternal life to people through ordinary things of life. I'll say it again. You can introduce eternal life to people through ordinary things of life. In this case, Jesus just used water and then he spoke about the living water of life. Very natural. And Another example, I mean, I didn't plan this, is bread. You know, people want bread. They, they want to eat. They want something. And you can go from bread to eternal life. Oh, did you know that Jesus says that he is the bread of life? Really? What does that mean? And then from there, you can witness. So you can introduce eternal life. How is Jesus the bread of life? He gave his life for us that we may be forgiven of our sins and obtain eternal life so you can introduce eternal life through ordinary things of life in conversation in this case it was water with Jesus and I said will you give me to drink will you give me some bread and then you start talking about the bread of life who is Jesus Christ so from I said from water Jesus introduced living water who is the Holy Spirit that gives eternal life uh, if you turn ahead here to John chapter 7 verse 37 talking about the Holy Spirit as the wellspring of life from those who believe but Jesus said on the last day or oh, it said that on the last day the greatest day of the feast Jesus stood and said in a loud voice if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink whoever believes in me as the scripture has said streams of living water will flow from within him and he says by this he meant the Holy Spirit whom those who believe in him will receive this is the spring of the wealth of land that is telling here to the, to the woman. In verse, in verse 13, he says, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. That's ordinary water. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling to eternal life. Those who believe in Jesus receive the Holy Spirit. They are baptized into the Holy Spirit and the Spirit in them well up to eternal life. And it is that Spirit that spurs you on to want to talk to others about Jesus, to want to witness to others. And nobody is even pushing you to do that because you want to do it because you have the Spirit who is urging you to do it. Anyone who drinks just the physical water will be thirsty again. But the person who drinks of the Holy Spirit, he will not be thirsty and will live unto eternal life forever and ever. Principle number five. Do not let existing barriers hinder you from evangelizing. Do not let existing barriers stop you or hinder you from evangelizing. Let's say for instance, I mean, we are in Cameroon. You know, we have the French speaking Cameroonians and the English speaking Cameroonians. We have multiple tribes. You may be from Mancon and another person may be from Kong. He may be from Bansa. This one may be Bamileke. This one may be Basa. This one may be Fang. This one may be Betty and so on. So we have these differences that sometimes can pose a barrier. But I'm saying from the principle of Jesus here that do not let such barriers hinder you from evangelizing. Cultural, racial, whichever barriers that may be. And as we look here with the example of Jesus, there are a few barriers that Jesus had to cross here. The first barrier he had to cross was the gender barrier. He is a man, she is a woman. She is coming to draw water at midday when most women must have drawn water in the morning, which means having had five husbands and living with another, which means she is a prostitute. So she was not only a woman, she was a prostitute. She was not only a prostitute, she was a Samaritan and Jesus was a Jew. And these two had no dealings with each other. So Jesus had to cross. I say here that he was by himself. Jesus was by himself and he was talking to a woman. It's like, uh, what is going on here, Jesus? Why are you by yourself and talking to a woman? Who? So he was by himself and talking to a woman who was by herself. In verse 27, when the disciples came, now we see that he said, just then his disciples returned and we are what? Surprised. The disciples came and were surprised that Jesus was talking with a woman. So that was a barrier. This was breaking a cultural taboo. Jesus broke a cultural taboo, you know. How can you be a Bamileke try to witness to me when I'm from Banso? No, we, we don't mix. How can you be an Anglophone and you're trying to witness to me I'm a Francophone? We don't mix. You see the point? I said, worse still, she was a prostitute. She had come to draw water at the sixth hour at noon without other women. And would you? Would you despise somebody because you think they're a prostitute? Yes, the way they are dressed may speak about who they are. But will you stop from witnessing them? Jesus did not stop. He crossed that barrier. Secondly, there was a cultural barrier. It said that the Samaritans had no dealings with the Jews. And Jesus had to cross this barrier. And then next, there was a racial barrier. You know, the Jews had thought of themselves as they were better than the Samaritans because the Samaritans were half Jews and they would look like, oh no, you mixed with the Gentiles. We have nothing to do with you. But Jesus crossed that barrier and asked the woman, if you know the gift of God. And then principle number six. And we're going to end here with principle number six. There's 12 of these principles. And we're going to end with number six here. I say, Pay attention to and avoid distractions. 
Pay attention to and avoid distractions as you try to reach people with the gospel. Yes, they are going to bring up a lot of distractions to avoid the point in question. Now, I've said here in my notes, Jesus refused to be distracted from the subject of eternal life by these barriers and the woman's digressions. Number one, so verse 10, he said, Jesus answered, if you know the gift of God. So he, she was saying here that, oh, are you better than us? Oh, we, we, are, we are from Jacob and Jacob had this uh, 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 well. Are you better than Jacob? Jesus said, answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who asked you to drink, you would have asked him and he will give you living water. So Jesus aimed at his goal, which was winning this woman's soul. You should also when you evangelize. I said the woman misunderstood Jesus and tried to play religion. She concentrated on the physical aspect of drinking the water or drawing the water. She was, I say, she was trying to be smart. She focused on her tradition and claimed ancestral worship. You're going to be focusing on somebody and they were going to say, oh, I go to this denomination. I go to this denomination. Oh, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. They will talk to you, but focus on their soul. Are they saved? Do they know Jesus? Do they know Jesus? I say that in spite of the woman's smartness and distractions, Jesus focused on her soul. Jesus focused on her soul verses 13 and 14 where he says everyone who drinks this water will thirst again but anyone who drinks of the water that i give him will never thirst again and this ends our sessions with six principles we're going to continue in our next session thank you